All right. Well, again, welcome everybody. Really happy to have you here with us. I'm very excited to be with these three new and different panelists. Again, as I mentioned, many of you who tuned in for our first session had the experience of three different panelists and, and probably what's going to be a very different discussion today. But these three panelists actually have some things that are in common with their articles. And I, I'm really excited to see those patterns as they begin to come out in the conversations. Mm -hmm. So this is the way that it will go. We're going to first hear from Steve Wood, and then we'll hear from Eva Ryder. Sorry, no, then we'll hear from Sharon Heath, and then Eva Ryder will wrap it up third. So you can be prepared for that. If those of you who are listening would like to make notes or, or um, write down questions, we will definitely save some time at the end for a few minutes of Q&A. So hopefully we'll have some, be able to have some good discussion there, even if it's just for a few minutes. I know these things are often you know, it's, it's hard to figure out the balance between the conversation and the presentation without taking everybody's Saturday. So we, we're trying, trying to do the best we can to make sure that we're finding that balance. So meanwhile, I think um, most of you probably know who I am. My name is Bonnie Bright, and I end up hosting a lot of these things. It's not always my preference to be on video, and I know that some of you feel the same way about that. But on the other hand, we have this amazing technology that allows us to be connected from all over the world. And um, I, I know that the four of us are in completely different locations and from what I can tell everybody who's in the audience is also in fact I know some of you are from different countries I, I see some people from South America some people from Europe uh, yes and people from all over the US and Canada so fantastic so let's let's just launch a little bit by talking about what technology has done for us, or maybe I should say to us. And <laughs> that, that can be taken either way, I guess, because I think that all of us are here and will agree that there are definitely good things that come out of technology. But there's also the shadow side of it that is very important to be aware of. And Jung had a lot of concerns about modernity. Of course, he had no experience with technology and, and a lot of the devices that we know of today because he died back in 1961. But his concern was really primarily over gadgets and machines and the capacity that we had to almost potentially destroy ourselves by not being able to be in a psychological frame of mind about these things. And he really felt that if we didn't address these issues psychologically, that it, it could really destroy mankind. So I, I'm not sure how far we'll get into some of that. I know some of your articles actually address that and some of the other articles in the book as well. There's a fantastic article from Glenn Slater, who's a professor at Pacifica Graduate Institute and a prolific writer, and he talks about the post-humans. And in our, our last panel, uh, Robert Ramanishan was talking about how people can be, become actually a different species because of the, the technology that we have. But anyway, I wanted to launch us by reading a quote from Jung on the topic, and he says, um, and I'm just going to mute you guys so that we don't get a lot of feedback from, from you. Or if you can mute yourselves, actually, that'd be great. Except, Steve, you, you don't need to, because <laughs> you're going to be up in just a moment. Um, so Jung said, all time-saving devices, amongst which we must count easier means of communication and other conveniences, do not, paradoxically enough, save us time, but merely cram our time so full that we have no time for anything. And he says that this is the cause for breathless haste, superficiality, and nervous exhaustion with all the concomitant symptoms, craving for stimulation, impatience, irritability, vac vacillation, etc. And these are things that I know I commonly observe in myself, and I have to wonder how much of it is just this, um, for one thing, this pace at which we live our lives. Also, the you know our incapacity to pay attention to one thing at a time and to go deeply in and to be more reflective about those kinds of things that we go in. And I know that Steve's article uh, addressed a lot of this, and so I'm excited to hear a little bit about what you have to say, Steve. Uh, finally, you closes and says, such a state may lead to all sorts of other things, but never to an increased culture of the mind and heart. So for me, I am constantly aware of community and how do we build community through technology? Is it even possible to, to do that? And what are the effects of this technology? I mean, I sometimes feel like I'm on 24-7. Sometimes I get messages from people. I have no idea where they're coming from. Is it coming from Facebook? Is it coming from Facebook Messenger? Because those are two different things, apparently. Is it coming from Twitter? Is it coming from my email? Is it coming from an instant text message? It's just, it's, it gets kind of crazy. And, and so there's definitely a need for some balance and uh, at least a very um, thoughtful and reflective 
stance on where we each stand in the middle of all this. So having said that, let's go to our panelists so that we have plenty of time for everybody to do what they would like to do and then, we'll, and then again, we'll have some questions at the very end. So let me just introduce you to Steve, first of all. <laughs> and I have to laugh because when I asked Steve for a bio, both for the book and for this panel, I got one line. <laughs> and I know Steve, and so that made perfect sense to me. And I promise I can share a little bit more about, about you than that. But this is the line that he gave me. He, he says, uh, Steve Wood is a psychological philosopher who lives in, and he was living at a different place at the time. He now uh, currently lives in Oporto, Portugal. Uh, so he's actually tuned in again from across the world from where I am. And so I think that that's, that's pretty amazing. But Steve and I also know each other quite well because we went through the, the doctorate program at Pacifica together. And I have just been profoundly inspired by Steve's work. He's always a very deep thinker and uh, has a really good way, a really interesting way of being able to, con to convert very phil philosophical thoughts and ideas into language that is easy to understand. So and has a lot of really interesting and profound thoughts about technolo technological issues, particularly, as I've noticed throughout the years that I've known him. So, Steve, thanks so much for spending your time with us today. Welcome, and uh, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Bonnie. Well, geez, Jung said quite a lot, but just to, I suppose I'll just say a little bit about the article I wrote. Uh, and in that article, the the initiator of it all is the speed at which we're functioning as human beings and how that speed has crept up exponentially over in a very short period of time like 20 years ago no one had a computational device like a cell phone or an extension of the body that was a uh, uh, having data and um the idea of that speed is working so fast that I don't think we even are able to know what's almost unconscious. And in fact, I would posit that the, the more reflective things I've been thinking about now are, are that it is unconscious, that it's operating on an unconscious level, and that the uh, electronic data that's being shoved at us all the time is coming uh, unconsciously through us and it's being now created by uh it's called content and it's being created by um large corporations governments um and i think the election was <clears throat> i think the 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 u.s election was a very it should be a very big wake-up call about the power of um uh, computational devices electronic content and the blurring of uh, what you might call the lived reality, lived world and an electronic world and also true truth and falsehood. So, um, you know, <laughs> so I thought the election was so weird. And I think that this breakdown where nowadays people don't know even what is true or what is false on the uh, that's coming through the internet this content that's being created content has always been uh you know we were always somewhat trusting that the content was coming from a reputable source like a, a google or a um, you know that you could trust that there was a generosity to it that it was legitimate i don't think you can now anymore and I think that's uh, kind of, should be kind of frightening. And I don't know really what to do. I, last night, Porto is a very interesting town where I am now, that it has very unusual people in it. And it's, um, it's strangely very, very advanced technologically. Like last night I was out, I went to um, what was called a meetup with people. And there were everyone that I was, that was there was a, basically a scientist and, or they were in IT. So we had very interesting conversations about the subject. And, um, you know, of course they're all interested like, well, how, how did, how did, I mean, I don't want to get too political, but how did Trump get elected? Trump got elected because I think because he and a group of people 
know how to manipulate uh, uh, unconsciously or subconsciously our um, wishes or people's wishes. Just to say, and it, it's very similar in the article that I, that's in Bunny, in the book that Bunny's uh, edited, it's very similar to the way advertising worked in like the 50s or the 40s when they originally were flogging toothpaste. Uh, you know, they would have a little jingle or something to go unconscious into your mind and then you would go, well, I'm just going to buy that toothpaste or I'll buy that cereal. And now it's uh, something of a different nature. It's not toothpaste anymore. It's, uh, it could be political views. It could be um, racial um, dislike or i mean I, I don't know where it stops from so yeah that's that's why i don't know if I don't, I don't know how much more i want to go on that really but uh it, it, it was it was the uh, the gist of the of the article that i wrote was that you have to be very vigilant about where content is coming from and even the word content is very weird because it's something that's being, it's something that you, that we are consuming electronically. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a type of, uh, I mean, the, the latest thing, it's this kind of electrofascism is what I would say. But, uh, that's, and I won't maybe go too much further on that. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I mean, you've brought up so many interesting points that I think really need to be addressed and I you know I mean here or elsewhere I hope that this conversation will continue online mm -hmm. that this whole thing about fake news has just been really devastating to me on so many levels partly because I recognize how much I get drawn into this and I don't realize it yesterday for example somebody sent by Facebook Messenger to me a, a, a video <laughs> which I promptly turned around and forwarded to about 10 people maybe 10 or 15 it wasn't a lot in today's terms, but it was, it was a few. Mm -hmm. And this video was about Standing Rock, and it was a woman who was, say, was pur purportedly in her car and saying that there were crop dusters flying around that were dropping um, toxins onto the protesters at, at Standing Rock. And I was, you know, understandably, I think, taken aback by this video. And I think that I, I'm also really willing to believe some of these things because of a lot of recent events and a lot of things that you mentioned, Steve. I mean, the, the, our in a, incapacity to be able to understand where the, the news is coming from, and yet uh, understanding that we are also more connected than more connected than we have ever been, and that we can get media and information and even true things in ways that we could never get before because people have cell phones everywhere and, and they're you know, also also Bunny, the absolute speed at which the information comes and. It doesn't even matter. That's how they're erasing that boundary between truth and fiction. Is that it doesn't matter? Oh, it's that was oh that was that was an hour ago. Now we're on to something new, and you just keep it moving so fast, so fast, so fast that no one can even remember. They don't even have to remember. You know, exactly. It's, it's they don't, yeah, they don't have to remember. And and you make a good. Uh, so just to close on that story. Well, of course, as soon as I sent that out, somebody I'd sent it to sent it right back to me. She said, "Oh, that was disproved. That that was vetted three and, and disproved three weeks ago. It's not a real video." So sure enough, I went on to Snopes, and there it was. It said specifically that that had been proven that it was false. Uh, for those of you who know that site, Snopes Snopes dot com. I assume everybody knows it at this point. But anyway, so it was. You know, it's like so. I I actually did feel like I was responsible. I needed to take to go back to every one of those people I'd sent it to and tell them it was false because I, I don't know how many of you saw it. I just typed in the chat, but that um, that article about Donald Trump being endorsed by the Pope was actually shared on Facebook almost a million times. Who knows if it influenced people or not, but how could it not uh, have influenced at least a handful of people? And so, and then there's one other thing, Steve, and then I think we'll move on to Sharon so that we can make sure that everybody can get in there. But one thing that you mentioned in your article, which you just barely touched on right here at the end, well, two things actually. One is our capacity for memory is actually decreasing because of all this. And one, uh, you, you mentioned if people are at a dinner table and somebody says, what's the, you know, the answer to this question, then everybody just whips out their mm -hmm. phone and Googles it, and then they have the answer right there, and then the conversation just moves on to something immediately. We don't have to remember details, facts, or, or those kinds of things anymore. And then the second thing that you talk about is how, that I was fascinated by, is 
you talk about how technology is becoming outdated. So even though we think that we have electronic records of things, mm -hmm. the technology is changing so fast. How many of us have hard drives or floppy disks or CDs or something from even just a few years ago that we can no longer access because our new computer doesn't have a CD player in it, which uh, is the case with me. Mm -hmm. and, and I know I have drawers full of these things and what do you do with it? And that kind of takes me to my own. Um, so, we, you know, we're losing our memory, even though we think it's safe for years or generations to come. That was kind of the joke I made when we started this panel is that, and I can't remember if I made that while we were recording or not, but I, I said, you know, this will be recorded for posterity or at least for the next few years because there's no guarantee posterity will ever see this after the next few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, I, I really appreciated your article, Steve. I, I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. And I, I really love the way you flowed from one topic to the next. But I, I believe that you hit on so many things that are highly relevant. So uh, if, if those of you who are listening to this haven't read Steve's article yet, please go back and do so. It's really important. So and I hope we get some questions for, for you at the end, Steve. Okay. So great. Thank you very much. So Sharon, let's go to Sharon Heath. And uh, let me just read Sharon's bio. First of all, Sharon's, uh, Sharon's article is called A Union Alice in Social Media Land, Some Reflections on Solastalgia, Kinship Libido, and Tribes Formed on Facebook. And really appreciated Sharon's article too. And ironically, actually, Sharon and Eva had some commonalities. Well, I had mentioned that, but they had some very specific commonalities among their articles, and yet they each took a very different take on it. So I'm really excited to see what Sharon and Eva are going to say. So Sharon, Sharon Heath, let me just tell you about her. Sharon Heath writes fiction and nonfiction, exploring the interplay of science and spirit, politics and pop culture. A certified union analyst in private practice and faculty member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles, she served as associate editor of Psychological Perspectives and guest editor of the special issue, The Child Within, The Child Without. Her chapter, The Church of Her Body, appears in the anthology Marked by Fire, Stories of the Jungian Way, which is a great book, by the way. And she has given talks in the United States and Canada on topics ranging from the place of soul in social media to gossip, envy, secrecy, and belonging. Her fiction series, The Fleur Trilo uh, Trilogy, beginning with the second edition of The History of My Body, will be released soon by Thomas Jacob Publishing. So, and, and by the way, that is a series of, of fiction, as I just mentioned, but that series, that, uh, the first book, which I have, is excellent. So I'm really happy to see that you're going to be releasing the next two of those books soon, Sharon. So congratulations on that. That's fantastic. So Sharon, I'm going to unmute you. Here we go. And it's all yours. Thanks so much, Bonnie. And thank you so much for this wonderful project. I mean, really, the book is terrific, really terrific. Um, I'm going to pick up, I think, on the thread that you had begun with in terms of it, can there be community through technology. And my, my piece was really all about Facebook and my own experiences with Facebook and some reflections on it. Um, I entered into all of this, this digital world very reluctantly, not unlike many Jungians, I think. Uh, having quite a resistance, a kind of a Luddite feeling about these machines and brave new world. And just as when I had first discovered Word Perfect after having been a novel writer writing on a yellow pad of paper longhand, Word Perfect could kind of do all kinds of stuff. I discovered that Facebook could do all kinds of stuff. And it was really exciting for me. Uh, the Fleur series that I've been writing fiction about is, is about a a young girl who is really quite captive to her terror of the void. And um, it's in some ways been a reflection of my own childhood as a kid who moved about every year and a half from neighborhood to neighborhood and was one of those outsiders who, who could never find a place and was quite lonely. Um, and so when I entered into the world of Facebook, initially to kind of publicize the novel, frankly, uh, I entered in as a voyeur, but I was quickly, the child in me was very captivated by the playfulness of it, by the, the sort of the interchange, the, the kind of, it was, it was like a Marco Polo game in this, this digital unconscious swimming pool. And, um, but I was what neuroscientist Gary Small calls a digital immigrant, for sure, versus my kids and many of your generation, Bonnie, who he would have called digital natives. 
Um, and one of the things that really turned me on as an immigrant were all the kinds of people I could connect with on Facebook that I wouldn't meet in my consulting room as an analyst, wouldn't meet at the Jung Institute in, in collegial meetings. There were physicists, there were poets, environmentalists, journalists, architects, musicians. I was just getting exposed to all kinds of stuff that maybe I would read about in The New Yorker, but wasn't meeting up with and having dialogue with. Um, Teilhard de Chardin had a lovely quote that, that, that connects for me with this, which is, there is almost a sensual longing for communion with others who have a large vision. The immense fulfillment of the friendship between those engaged in furthering the evolution of consciousness has a quality impossible to describe. And I think that I was really initially getting in, it was like, oh my goodness, I, I really started to experience this kind of bizarre communion with people like Eva, who I had never met before, but who I connected with first on, on Facebook. Aligned with that for me, in my mind, is something that Anais Nin once said, that each friend represents a world in us, a world not born until they arrive, and it is only by this meeting that a new world is born. So coming at this sort of from the feeling function, I think that there is a way at its best that something like Facebook, or even certainly what we're engaged in today, can really meet some very powerful uh, and, and really deepening human needs. Um, Levi Strauss, the anthropologist, the brilliant uh, anthropologist, offered, he, he sort of wrote about the alliance theory of exogamy, that, that the ritual marrying between peoples of two or more tribes sort of ensured the economic and cultural flourishing of, of all those groups. And that's part of, I think, what can be at best the, the enrichment that goes on in something like Facebook. And I, I want to use uh, kind of just as an example uh, a few threads uh, that I've experienced on my own page that will kind of give a flavor of that. I actually still know people who are not on Facebook, so I want to give them a bit of a feel of what it can be at its best. Uh, in one uh, instance, I posted uh, from Mary Oliver's poem, Wild Geese. And Mary had written, whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. And then I get a response from a woman named Deborah Jane Stein, and all the people I'm citing here have given their approval to be, go public in this way. And Deborah was, is a very interesting woman, as I discovered on Facebook. She was born uh, in prison to a, a, uh, an addicted mother and spent her first year of life in solitary confinement with that mother and had a heck of a life sort of after that and has used that, that sort of early experience in a very transformational way. Uh, she speaks at prisons throughout the country, primarily women's prisons, and she's quite an inspirational speaker in terms of you know, really addressing how lives can get turned around by connecting with our depths. And, um, and in fact, Deborah was about to come out uh, to L.A. to talk to a couple of prisons out here, and I said, oh, you, you, you've got to come and stay with me. And my kids were appalled. It's like, Mom! You met this woman on Facebook, you have no idea she could be an ax murderer. And in fact, unbeknownst to me, when Deborah came to stay, they were driving around the house as if they could see that I had been ax murdered while they were driving around. And in fact, Deborah's family back there, it turned out, were also very concerned. But I have found, in fact, that meeting people who were once digital companions in the flesh has generally been extremely meaningful and has just filled out who they are on the printed page. At any rate, Deborah responds, I think I need to read this to the women in prisons next month. Thanks for the reminder. I just read it aloud, imagining 1,200 women in khakis listening to this, waiting for those, with those arms crossed to uncross as I walked amongst them with poetry, even the guards will listen to this one. I bet, I bet I get a kind of church kind of amen on it. 
to which then Carolyn Raffensperger jumps in. Now, Carolyn's another person who I met first on Facebook, then came and stayed here. And Carolyn's one of the, speaking of Standing Rock, she's a primary environmental attorney in the U.S. and is representing the water protectors in Standing Rock. And she says, Deborah, this poem is in your honor. Uh, Hafez said, the small man builds prisons for everyone he knows, but the wise woman must duck under the moon to throw keys to the beautiful and rowdy prisoners. Then another woman jumps in, Margot Stepping, who's an artist and entrepreneur, and she talks about something she'd watch with Eve Ensler at the New Bedford Correctional Facility, what I want my words to do for you, so it's just, it, it's like it plays. It's a kind of, can be a call and response that can be deepening, uplifting, moving, tear producing. And that's, I think for me, been Facebook at its very best, besides conveying occasionally real true information, not just the faux stuff. Um, so I, I'm gonna kind of skip ahead a bit at the same time, we all know of the multiple shadows of social media, and because it's all about light, light that keeps people up at night and gives them insomnia, it's got a very deep shadow. Uh, in particular, what I wrote about in the chapter was sort of the shadowy effects um, on children, developing kids, who are so immersed in all this. Cyberbullying is not funny. Kids have committed suicide as a consequence of it. Uh, there's a comparing of self with these idealized versions of how others kind of present themselves. Certainly the loss of embodied relationship. Um, we've learned that, that the youngest generation are losing the capacity to discern what different facial expressions convey, uh, which you know is pretty appalling. Uh, Overexposure of their own sexuality and their soulfulness. Um, but what I'm most aware of these days, and it, it's echoing, I think, your concern, Steve, is, is the shadow side for adults. Uh, beyond the addictiveness and the time suck and the trivializations of too many cat videos is um, the lack of exo the, the exo exogamy that I think it started out with. You know, there's been this trend, at least on Facebook, and, and sort of anybody who's on it can, can track it, where over time, who appears in a news feed and becomes easily available, whose posts become easily available, has been tailored more and more to whatever we post, not just that, whatever we buy on Amazon. Uh, we we're getting kind of news alerts that are once again specifically designed for our tastes. Um, and what's happening is that, that what I see in terms of Facebook's sort of autonomous posting is very different from a distant relative who's a gun collector. He's seeing a completely different world than I am seeing. And that's not out of my choice, it's about what Zuckerberg and, and his friends who've given us this wonderful gift are choosing to present to us. So in terms of what has happened in this kind of increased polarization that is going on really across the world, and we've become so aware of it in the US with this election season, is being very much exacerbated, not just by fake news, but tailored fake news. So, you know, there's a lot of kind of speaking to the choir, not much learning about what the other is thinking, feeling, how the other is viewing the world. And I think it's, it's a terrible trend uh, that is, is basically intensifying the polarization in ways that don't feed the I vow that is so necessary for soul's development. That's one piece. The other piece that, that just I want to make a very brief comment on is that I'm very preoccupied with this whole notion of the void uh, because my, my protagonist led me there. And the void is, of course, where all creation begins. Um, uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, quote from Jim Harrison's wonderful novel, Dava. He says, I remember my grandfather telling me how each of us must live with a full measure of loneliness 
that is inescapable. And we must not destroy ourselves with our passion to escape this aloneness. And um, I think it, it echoes much of what Steve wrote about and you just talked about. But I think that's one of my primary concerns about all of this inundation of media, handheld and otherwise, is that there's not the moment for the soul to kind of really be alone with himself uh, or herself and, and, and really experience communion with the depths. And mm, I don't know what the heck we do about it except a kind of a personal, person-by-person -person discipline but it is a profound loss that is taking place because the psyche moves very slowly. It's not quick, quick, quick. You know, it, it, it speaks with the language of the ages. It's archaic and it needs us and we desperately need it. So, yeah. Thank you, Sharon. I mean, <laughs> you've hit very much on something that I think, I at least I think about a lot every single day and that is, you know, how do we, how do we retain the soul in the midst of all this? You know, there, there's a lot of soul loss that's happening because of technology. And if you, if you know, if, if you're familiar with that term, and probably most of you are, um, it's this idea that the soul has basically fled the body or parts of it has been, you know, relegated to the underworld. And, and I think that we need to be spending exactly, exactly that. We need to be spending more time almost in that underworld where our soul actually is. And so how do we drag ourselves away from all of the media and all of this interconnectivity? So it, it is very much the shadow side of things. I, I really love in your article, you actually wrote, and, and this is where you began, I think. You wrote, I find myself thinking of those with whom I regularly communicate wall to wall as my Facebook tribe one of millions of tribes singing songs of the dark times back and forth across the internet and in the process constellating little sparks of conscious light. I love that because it, it does speak to our connectivity, but it also speaks to the power of technology. I, I, as you were sitting here saying that, I, I just, I was, I was sitting here thinking maybe instead of doing these kinds of, of more educational or, um, I guess educational or, or events that give people exposure to new ideas, maybe we should also have events where we all just show up and sit in silence for, <laughs> for 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of being facetious when I say that, but, but yeah, it's a really good question. How do we do that unless it's an individual discipline one at a time? And I know a lot of people have practices where they do a daily practice, whether it's yoga or meditation or walking or prayer or something else where they can actually spend that time. But a lot of people don't, <laughs> including myself, many times. Well, what's tricky is I think that some people are kind of relegating, like with the practice of yoga or meditation, kind of soul connection to these little squidgy mm -hmm. moments, rather than ensouling all of, of our experience. And I think that's where, where it's there. the body, I think, comes in, amongst other things, is, is that it's, it's most important, too, as we're processing even this media, as we're sitting here, I'm sort of aware that my cats are outside the door. I've shut them out so that they wouldn't be all over the keyboard here. But that, 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 that instinct needs to kind of be with us all the time, even when we're da -da 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 on the screen, that, that it's most important to kind of remind self of soul because we don't just want it operating in the unconscious. The whole point of the human adventure is to lift this into consciousness. Yeah. And so I'm not quite sure, but that's a little bit of what I'm thinking about these days. Yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful. Well, thank you. Keep thinking because you are, as you wrote in the book, you are one of many people who are contributing these sparks of consciousness around it. So it's really lovely. Thank you so much, Sharon. All right, let's move on to our final panelist. This is Eva Ryder. And her article is called Through the Looking Glass, Reflections and Adventures in Social Media. So again, as I mentioned, kind of a similar theme, but a very different, well, different, yeah, a different take on it. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Eva. Let me tell you about her. Eva Ryder, MA, LMFT, is a union depth psychotherapist, a workshop leader, and lecturer. She holds a BA in history from McGill University and an MA in psychology from John F. Kennedy University, where she also taught as an adjunct instructor. Eva is a graduate of the Marion Woodman Body Soul Rhythms Leadership Training, a certified hypnotherapist and dreamwork teacher, exploring personal and archetypal dream processes using fairy tale, myth, music, art, poetry, and movement. 
Eva's passion is a journey of unveiling the feminine through correspondences between Jungian theory, alchemy, and psyche soma, as revealed through the glyph of the hermetic tree of life. And you can find her at www.reclaimingsoul.com. And I, I will just add to that, Eva and I have done a, a course together, which was recorded. I think we did that last year. Eva's going to be rerunning that same course very soon. And that was on the tree of life. And it was absolutely a beautiful way of following the, the path of individuation through the tree of life, um, among so many other insights that I had through that. So uh, Eva, the, the time is yours. Oh, and you're muted. Hold on one second. I can unmute you. There we go. Okay, thank you. I wanted to respond to begin with. My introduction to uh, social media was very analogous to the one that uh, Sharon described as well. And somehow I stumbled into the Facebook world. And um, I have a public page, but it was the private page that just took off. And it happened partially because on my searches, I stumbled onto the Alice in Wonderland quotes. And in exploring the Alice in Wonderland quotes, uh, <laughs> I suddenly, a community began to form around that. And I was really surprised that it spoke to so many people because so much of it is about, right, Lewis Carroll speaking about nonsense, you know, and suddenly this nonsense was making sense to many of us. And I think the metaphoric language is the bridge. Um, and that, that is this created possibility in a soul community that's emerged uh, through uh, social media for me personally. So uh, in spite of one of the things that uh, Sharon was talking about and I wrote about here uh, was, you know, feeling really alone, feeling really isolated in my world because as a therapist, there's one there's that relationship, but you're certainly holding that uh, clear mirror as much as possible. And so the rest of uh, my life, oftentimes there was a sense of isolation. And social media and this, of course, this extraordinary um, medium that we are now exploring, just being here together, uh, began to shift that. So. One of the things uh, that I wrote here was that through our loneliness, whether it be in the guise of wrenching loneliness or its cure, solitude, um, we ult ultimately bump into one another. We are souls traveling side by side. Technology developed the highway, but we are the ones who are creating the threads that weave us together in a global tapestry. And so on a positive side, I started to experience that happening and meeting people, um, who I, some of whom I've actually come to meet when they've passed through my town, I've come to meet them and discovered that the soul connection was so powerful that we had created that, um, it was as though we'd always known each other. And I, I find that really extraordinary um, on the positive side. Um, so, a couple of things in the uh, that I had written about was this breakdown in communication um, that the internet is creating this Tower of Babel where um, the so-called uh, fake news is intermingled with the propaganda and what happened to me yesterday is what happened to you Bonnie I was in the bank I, I turned on my I had my phone and there was this uh, Dakota uh, pipeline video and it came from you and I thought it said do not send to Facebook so I stood in the bank in line I started to send it to people and I spent part of the afternoon yesterday having to apologize to all these people because I had sent them fake news so and uh, it's very interesting experience that wow you can't just be button pushing and uh, so one of the things uh, so that, that I discovered is, and I think some of what I was writing, uh, what I was intrigued about in writing this, this essay was that we are perhaps developing a telepathic blinking of mind uh, through image and symbol. And there's a primal form of communication that's getting activated through the internet that we didn't expect 
or we would not be here right now um, having this conversation. Um, Jung said that um, loneliness does not come from no people about one, but from being unable to communicate the things that seem important to oneself or from holding certain views which others find inadmissible. And that is one of the gifts of having these connections, that we can transcend that, uh, that we can find these like-minded people, um, the four of us being in um, such completely different places right now, and yet we're able to have it. So I've found that, that that's been a great gift. Um, the other thing that I spoke of was John Wyndham's novel, The Chrysalids, which I actually um, came to me, I mean, it was part of our curriculum in high school. I went to, uh, I went to high, high school in Montreal, and it's a whole different world. And we, and this was, this book was the curriculum. It was written in 1955. It's a science fiction novel. It's uh, post nuclear holocaust and the characters in the book which i just wanted to go into there are these people who have been uh, who are considered mutants who are deformed from the um, nuclear uh, radiation and they are relegated to what they call the fringes which are the edges of society because they no longer fit and there's these two characters david and his cousin rosalind who have this very strange ability to be able to speak to each other in thought shapes and they send these thought shapes and they are not, um, it's something that they somehow sense that is secret and instinctively, and they don't tell anyone except their uncle. And their uncle is a sailor, so he's been all over the world. Oh, and by the way, they live in a place called Labrador. Labrador is now inhabitable. And the society they live in is a very um, uh, fundamentalist kind of, a biblical society based on the physical attributes of every every everyone's hand has five fingers on it and that these are the laws of, of God and everyone on the fringes some some people have six fingers and three eyes you know is absolutely an abomination and so David and Rosalind are told that they need to keep themselves separate from this. And what happens is they discover over time that there are about nine other people, or eight or nine other people, who are they start to communicate with through the thought shapes. And eventually, um, to give the whole thing away, their sister is born who has, her, David's sister, Petra, who has a very powerful ability and connects with some people in New Zealand, which is called Sealand. And these people in New Zealand, it turns out, finally communicate to them that this is this telepathic ability is actually a leap an evolutionary leap and that the and the world has completely changed so the reason i told this whole story and um the background is that i feel that the internet has that potential for us that this on a positive level in spite of all the fake news and propaganda and the there's a place where we can connect all of us um, intuitively, instinctively, that there's a telepathic thing forming um, also with like-minded souls that is like a, a net, a web um, that is extraordinary. And uh, um, so getting back to, uh, uh, after I had written this, I mean, there were there were quotes by uh, uh, Terence McKenna. For one thing, saw this happening as the internet being a. Uh, uh, let's see if I can find the quote. Um, the internet is the global brain, the cyber spatially connected telepathic collective domain that we've all been hungering for, and. Perhaps it's possible that eventually we will actually transcend the technology itself. And um, that by crossing that bridge into this metaphoric language um, that some of us are able to use, we, we leap, we, we can move back and forth between the bridge between the two worlds and understand each other in, beyond the fake news. Um, and I realize that I'm being overly perhaps overly positive <laughs> and uh, 
the other notes that I had uh, taken is uh, David Bowie um, also was somebody who predicted the shift in, in the, and this, with, that the internet caused. He mentioned the French American artist Marcel Duchamp, whom he called prescient on the idea that a piece of work is not finished until the audience adds its own interpretation. So our whole communication structure is changing. And what the piece of art that he described is about is the gray space in the middle. And when I think about the gray space in the middle, I think of the polarities and I think the tension of the opposites, but also the transcendent third. And the play, that's where the gray space between the black and white can exist. And we don't know what that is, but there's incredible possibility there. Yeah, you, you've picked up on a theme that is, is really critical and well, in fact, there's so many themes, it's hard to kind of know where to go next, but over the course of this panel, we've seen these themes about, well, let's see, one thing that, that Sharon just said that, and then something you just said made me think of that as well, is that is that when two people meet, there's a new world that's created. So there's some kind of a field that comes up between these two people. And so there's, there is so much power and potentiality around people creating what, uh, what are, I, I think it was Seth Godin, who's a kind of a social media expert, has called silos. And these are silos of people that are like-minded. And so communities are beginning to come together on the internet, beginning to, they have been now for years, if not decades, ever since the internet started, that are like-minded people. And they may be those people at the margins. And it may be those people with six fingers or three eyes that are actually showing up and, and able to find that community that they've been so longing for and, and you know, to, to but, but it is taking social, social, what do I want to say, connection to a whole different level because we are meeting in ways that are not the same. It's not that embodied kind of experience that we are used to having. And I had typed into the chat earlier, I don't know if everybody saw it, but there are actually 83 million fake profiles on Facebook. And we, you know, we don't know who those people are, what they are. So there, there's also the shadow side of assuming that the people that are showing up are, are who they say they are and, and don't have sort of malintent, I guess. And I think Sharon, you, you know, I can understand why you said your kids were worried when you said that you, <laughs> you were gonna go stay with some demon on Facebook. And, and so the, the, all of these things are, are very, very difficult to sort out as you start looking at it because it's easy to see the positive and then it's also easy and I think important to look at the, the shadow side as well. And, and it's not that we have to necessarily have answers about it, but it's really important that we're looking at it. And for me, that's what depth psychology is really about. So we have just a few minutes left. I would love to open this up to those of you who have been in the audience listening and watching. And if you have questions and you'd like to ask that question personally by voice, you can just put your electronic hand up. If you move your mouse on the screen, you'll see a hand signal there that you can click on and that will raise your hand and then I can unmute you. You're also welcome to type chat in the chat function, uh, comments or questions, and I can just read those questions and, and pass them along. And then I have a question while we're waiting for people to respond and please don't be shy this is a great opportunity to have access to these people who have such brilliant ideas but while we're waiting Steve I wanted to ask you a question and that is if you can maybe just expound a little bit on what you had written in your article about screens because you you kind of trace the progression of screen size and correlate it with some interesting yeah. shifts in our culture so maybe you can say a few words about that because it actually in my mind it's related to what we were just talking about but We'll see where you go with that. Well, the yeah. So the gist was that the screen started out as a play, then it went to like a movie screen, and then it went to a television, then it went to a, a computer, and then it went very rapidly to a handheld device. And without too much imagination, um, some of the thinking I'm thinking about now has to do with um, penetrating the body, and uh, that the screen rather than just carry it around. I mean, everyone's carrying around the screen and looking at it, so why not have it just implanted? Okay. And so I'm sure that that's, you know, coming up and it has to do, in my, in my thinking, that, that subject is, um, I've commingled that with uh, tattooing, but that's a different subject. Uh, and the idea of the screen is that each, each of the screens, as it's gotten smaller and smaller, there's more people involved in the, in consuming the content. Mm -hmm. So initially the movie was 
oh, so let's say a few hundred people consuming the content in one place, and then it was uh, television was, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands or a million people, and then uh, now we have uh, Facebook, and what did you say, Bonnie? There was 1.8 billion monthly users. Wow. So, I mean, there, <laughs> it's sort of exponentially growing. <laughs> And um, and yeah. I, I, I suppose I always come back to the idea of like, where's the information? Where are the origins of information? And the origins of information uh, initially were our own fantasy level and our own subconscious fantasies that we created from the lived surround, let's say. And uh, increasingly this, uh, uh, this information or this uh, content is being produced by corporations mm -hmm. and that i that i feel is a very yeah it's a, it's interesting and i'm not i'm 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 curious i like the idea that oh the, the facebook that i can make thought forms and i realize yeah i have a lot of contacts with that and i really appreciate being able i love gps because i have really bad directional ability so uh, there's things I like about it, and it's not all bleak. But I am a rather, um, let's say, the line of thought has brought me to, I'm sure that there's groups of people that are aware of how powerful um, Facebook is, let's say, and what can be done through Facebook, or what can be done through Google. Like, we trust Google. Google is like you know the 24 karat gold of uh, information you you if you want to know something about uh, jung's birth date you look it up and, or i don't know about jung's birthday but you get the idea i mean there's uh, a lot of um yeah and what and i'm sure that what what happens if uh, if that's not trustworthy or what happens if if uh, the you know, Sergey Brin and these guys. What if? What if they're not there anymore? What if someone else uh, has that information and has that control? Then what? You're mm -hmm. talking about a great novel right there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what. Who said that? Someone. I sent it to. I met this guy uh, last night at this meetup, and I sent him the the excerpt from this book, and he said it reminded him of Philip K. Dick. Yeah. But uh, which I took as kind of a, a compliment, I guess, but it wasn't meant that way. But of course, he I, he he said I only read half of it so far, and I thought the last part was. Yeah. One thing that strikes me is we're we're involved in in something. We're trying to kind of describe this this elephant that we're all sort of riding on, and it's evolving, as you say, with such great speed as we're riding on, and it's so difficult to actually get a view of what the heck is going on. One thing that occurs to me when you, when you talk about sort of the third thing is that it's psyche that has created all of this. I mean, all of this has, has, has emerged from the imaginal properties that, that this is in some senses being directed by the unconscious. And, and when I talk about can there be soul in social media, well, there is soul in so social media because it all comes out of soul. And I guess one of the questions I have is, what is the teleology of it? If indeed the unconscious has kind of moved the human soul to, to image and then create and then do all these, these wild and crazy things with these constantly developing media forms, then where, where is psyche aiming us? I don't, something in my instinctual self says it's not aiming us to be totally kind of co-opted by you know global corporate manipulators although they certainly are going to are doing it already and will continue to to try to kind of get hold of all of our minds at the same time i don't think it's in order to develop this hybrid creature as i think it was tim berners lee who initially imagined that someday we would become part human and part machine um, but it is a great mystery to me. What is the teleology to all of this? Mm -hmm. what, what control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Control. Control. Control by? Well, that's, it's the loss of control. Uh, the human, the human, uh, my, 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 my take on it would be that it's the loss of control of your, 
lived environment you live around, which is like your environment, your uh, political system, your life on the planet, and the loss of control as that diminishes, then the embrace of uh, technology has become stronger. So there is a comp it's a compensatory uh, uh, embrace. Mm -hmm. And um, let let me jump in here, know. Steve. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, have you finished your thought? Yeah, yeah. I just want to jump in and read a, a comment or a question from, from the audience that is maybe relevant to this. And Rosalind writes, I feel the web, internet chatting, Facebook, etc., is a collective pool, but I'm wondering how we raise our individual consciousness by using it, meaning I think the internet chatting, uh, and how able we are to separate what we need and what we don't need. Its superficiality is so seductive. <laughs> I think we can most of us relate to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure that many people are able to figure out the levels of content that is uploaded and how truths are hardened into facts. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I respond to that briefly? Because I was starting to write about that. Uh, I was asking Steve a question and then I, somehow it didn't go through. But I really, coming back to Jung, it's through connecting through the metaphor, through that bridge that is the metaphor that connects between um, image and symbol. And if we're speaking from that mythopoetic language to each other, we're somehow able to navigate the internet in a way where the actual hard facts and truths and lies somehow we're not, we don't have to, we don't have to take it all in. Everything that we read uh, we, you know, so the question that, that I, in, in response to what Rosal is saying, that I, I try to articulate here is how much is, when we take in fact, we, we need to, we have to be able to discern and to question, is this real? I mean, what is behind it? Who is, who is putting, like yesterday with the North Dakota information or a lot of the information that what what you had spoken of bonnie about the the pope endorsing trump but if we bypass all that and we align with what our own individual souls are speaking from aligning with the mythopoetic and speaking from that place then we're speaking from the place of the third and we can align us on the soul level even as everything else is breaking down and everything of course is, I mean, you turn on the news and you have to turn the news off and find that place again in order to find sanity yeah. right now. Yeah, it's a really important point. Somebody said to me once, you know, um, I, I just, I'm talking about the news thing actually, which grabbed me and that is, I think that as a society, we do watch way too much news and Quote, quote unquote news. I mean, even as Steve's pointing out, some of the trusted sources now are coming into question. So a lot of this is also about trust. You know, who can we trust? Who is trying to control us? Um, how do we begin to discern all that? Of course, these are questions we're just getting into this and I know <laughs> it's going to be time to end. And so I, I, I think I always think we should allow more time for these kinds of discussions. But, but, but it's an important point. And so what one thing that somebody said to me that made a lot of sense once was we need to turn off the news and then pay attention to the news that's coming from the, the soul, essentially, or that third thing that you're talking about, Eva, you know, watching our dreams. Our dreams are the news the headlines from, from the soul, basically. And so tapping into that is really important. Sharon? And I, yeah, I'd just like to throw in something that I learned years ago in anthropology, is that in traditional cultures, the emphasis is sort of on the elders and their carrying the wisdom of what has been. And as cultures kind of modernize, the, the weight of value tends to accrue to the young and to the news or what is new. And one of the things that Jung talked about was that the function of the archetype is to reconnect us to the root condition. So it, it occurs to me that, that as Rosalind has addressed all of us panelists with her, I think, really important question here, that, that how do we discern kind of how to hold a posture in relation to this proliferation of speedy input that is available 24-7 is to kind of move the fulcrum back toward also what the ancestors have to say inside, what the earth has to say inside, what the body has to say inside, what my cats outside this door have to say. That, 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 that we've gotten way overbalanced. I mean, I'm intrigued that it's even called the news, when in fact there's this tremendous source of wisdom 
that goes backwards in time to those who lived more closely with the earth. So that's, that's just a piece I'd like to throw. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to honor our time commitment here and we are at the, at the hour. I just wanted to read the last couple of comments. Actually, Rosalind was responding to that and we, we can close on that. She says, so are we accepting that we have natural filters that we can help each other to recognize what's real and necessary? I think that's a beautiful way to put it. A natural filter is a way that all of us can understand, even those without necessarily a background or understanding, deep understanding of Jungian or depth psychology. I would also call that natural filter something else. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have different names for it, but soul is a good one. Yeah, there's something that we can tap into that helps us to understand that. The question is, can we, you know, move at a pace that is actually allowing us to do that? Or are we just as I was and Eva, you too, when we were pushing those buttons to send that video, you know, can we can we slow down and, and tap into that first? And so um so Rosalind says, I like what Steve was saying about control because when our physical lives, where we live, how we live becomes more degraded, lack of resources, a sense of our bodies, our dependence on imaginary lives within the out there web becomes very strong. So we begin to, yeah, to re regain that balance, I think. And then um, Myra says, denied, neglected shadow lodged in the emotions do not respond to reason or linear truth. It has a truth and this electorate found someone speaking to the emotional body, it seems. This emotional body responded to juvenile rants that echoed, was deeply held emotionally in many uh, and understood by more. Truth did not matter in that case. So, you know, it's a fine line for that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it will be important, Susie says, it will be important to find trusted guardians of information. And I think that's a really good point moving forward for mm -hmm. the future. You know, Facebook was really hit hard because they don't have, you know, they don't have people that are actually vetting that news. Mm -hmm. They're just allowing it to run rampant on Facebook. And so should there be some kind of a vetting process, a formal vetting process? And who should those people be? Well, you know, when does it turn into censorship? And so there's, there's this fine line, you know, it needs to be some kind of a spiritual guardian, in, in my opinion. And, and that comes back to the individual because we each have that capacity in ourselves. We each have that aspect of ourselves to be that sort of spiritual guardian of truth and integrity. So, and, yeah. yeah and, um, and just to respond very briefly to that, it's that, again, it's that vertical. I mean, we have to be able to trust that vertical, uh, the information coming this way, mm -hmm. as opposed to that, the horizontal. Because right now, what, as, as Sharon said, and as been, uh, Myra said, what is news right now? It, you know, we don't know what's true and what isn't. So we've got to be very conscious how we navigate because things are changing so quickly right now, especially since the election. Yeah. In terms of what you know, there you know what they call fake news is just another word for propaganda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can be. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. So appreciate your time today. Thanks to everybody who was in the audience and for your thank comments you so and questions, much. especially in the chat. And to the panelists, really wonderful work. So appreciate it. Uh, again, if you haven't got the book already, you can get the book on in either paperback or as a, an ebook on Amazon. And I uh, encourage you to do that. There are lots of amazing articles that are in here. Thank you again, everybody. Please feel free to follow up online, either in the Alliance Facebook group or on, uh, on DepthPsychologyAlliance.com in the forum there. You can find it under the dialogue tab. And please continue to, you know, let's have these conversations because they're so critically important. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bonnie. Bye-bye. Well, thanks, Bonnie. That was Thank a you, pleasure. Bonnie. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. So